Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Hugh Hammer, and uh, I am supposed to remind you to uh, submit your questions uh, to the Q&A box, um, and I'll address those questions at the end of this presentation. Um, so the title of my presentation is The Zebrafish Husbandry Education Efforts by Gadsden State Community College, the University of Alabama at Birmingham, and a community of scholars from the Zebrafish Husbandry Association. I'd first like to acknowledge all my co-authors who got me into this mess in the first place, and uh, that is Dr. Susan Farmer and Dr. Uh, Stephen Watts. They're the directors of the UAB Zebrafish Corps at the University of Alabama at Birmingham, and also Dr. Samuel Kartner, um, and he is the Vice President of Animal Research Services at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. I'd also like to acknowledge another co-author, and that's Carrie Barton. Um, she's currently the president of the Zebrafish Husbandry Association, and uh, that is an organization that has been behind this effort from the very beginning. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, I first want to uh, show you guys a little bit about where we're at. Um, I'm at Gadsden State Community College, and this is in Gadsden, Alabama. So we are about two and a half hours northwest of Atlanta, Georgia. Um, we are about an hour north of Birmingham, Alabama, a little north and east, and then uh, about an hour southwest of Chattanooga, Tennessee. So um, this slide kind of shows you where we're at. This is the Aquaculture Education and Development Center at Gadsden State Community College, and this is the program that I manage. Um, I manage this program with a, a senior technician, Timothy Adams, and uh, an assistant, Tabitha Downs, um, but I am the only faculty member at this facility. It is a 26-acre facility. Um, we have 13 freshwater ponds. We do uh, between 12 and 15 different species at this facility at any given time. Um, this facility is unique in that it is entirely dedicated to education. Um, there's not a lot of different research efforts that are going out here other than just student projects. So we really have the ability to do um, whatever we really want to. Um, we also have uh, large indoor hatchery spaces. We have wet labs, dry labs, and office space here. And we have a large dedicated classroom. The students in the program are really encouraged to uh, get their hands wet from the first day that they come through the doors. Um, and we like to have our students uh, get experience with everything that we work with at the facility. So in that respect, it is really unique. Um, we're also a community college program that currently has uh, seven bachelor's degree students. Uh, and a lot of these bachelor's students come here because of the unique program and their, uh, the unique ability to get valuable practice and valuable experience while they're here. This is our indoor hatchery space. Um, it's about 2,000 square feet, um, and we have about uh, you know, 34,000 liters of recirculating water um, in this hatchery space. Uh, we have nine independent systems. The systems are managed by the students, um, and uh, you know, so they're responsible for feeding their fish and taking care of their tanks and all that fun stuff. Um, they're also responsible for the ponds and the pond work that goes out here. So they really get a good chance to get a lot of different experiences. This is our dedicated classroom space. Uh, our classroom space is used only for this program, um, and it really gives us the ability to do a lot of different types of workshops. Uh, for about the last 15 years, we've had a uh, teacher aquaculture effort. Um, and uh, it's been, uh, you know, a very, very strong uh, project for this particular program. Um, we've trained about 400 different school teachers um, over, the, over the last several years. This is our greenhouse system. Um, in our greenhouse, we have an aquaponic and hydroponic uh, production systems. So we produce some plant materials as well. Um, and we also have a 17,000 gallon in the ground bioflock system. Um, so. These are some of the animals that we aquaculture here. Um, we have marine ornamentals. We do tilapia, uh, freshwater prawns, rainbow trout when it's in season. Uh, we can do hybrid stripe striped bass here. 
we do channel catfish, of course, uh, largemouth bass, and sunfishes, and also ornamental koi. So we, we have the ability to do a wide variety of animals here. And then, of course, we do zebrafish, and that's going to be the rest of this presentation. Um, you know, no introduction to the program would be complete without really addressing and talking about the students. Um, we rely on our students very heavily out here. As I had mentioned to you, um, I'm the only faculty member out here, and there's a, just a few staff members. So we really rely heavily on the students to do the things that we need to do out here. And, uh, and they're really great about uh, helping us get all the work done. So what is zebrafish? Well, uh, zebrafish is Danio ririo. Okay, it's a small tropical fish native to Southeast Asia. It's native to the modern countries of Malaysia, Bangladesh, and India. Uh, it is a very well-known tropical hobbyist fish um, because it is very, very tough. Um, it can handle a wide variety of water chemistry conditions and a wide variety of growing conditions. It's some of these same characteristics that have made it a popular research model. Uh, according to the Zebrafish Information Network, or ZFIN, um, there are about 780 laboratories worldwide that are registered on ZFIN. Uh, the number of different laboratories using zebrafish as a model for research in the U.S. varies somewhere between 300 and 500 labs. Um, but what's kind of interesting about all of this is that there are really no training programs for technicians that work with these fish anywhere in the world. And uh, so that's what we're trying to do here. Um, some of you may be asking, well, why zebrafish? Well, probably the, the biggest reason uh, zebrafish are used as a research model is that they have transparent embryos that are fertilized externally. And these embryos, during their early development, show all of the higher vertebrate characteristics. So that it makes, makes them a very useful organism to manipulate for genetics and for mutations and all kinds of other different developmental work that might want to be done. Um, the fish are also very prolific breeders. Um, breeding pairs can be bred out more than once a week, um, and they can lay large numbers of eggs, um, you know, and that reproduction can be very tightly controlled so that you know the exact age of the embryos. Um, zebrafish also grow to reproductive age pretty quickly. Um, most laboratories can get them to a reproductive age in less than 60 days. As I had already previously mentioned, uh, zebrafish are a pretty hardy aquatic species. Um, they can handle a wide variety of different growing environments and a wide variety of different, uh, you know, physical manipulations and water chemistry parameters. So um, they're a very good model to work with in that respect. They're also economically competitive with mice. Uh, zebrafish require less infrastructure. Um, you can hold large numbers of animals in very, very confined spaces. Um, and, you know, that makes them more economically competitive um, with mice. The genome for zebrafish has been sequenced, and there are already a number, a large number, of different genetic lines and different mutations that are available to the research community. So all of these things are uh, very good reasons why zebrafish has become an increasingly popular research model. On the lower right-hand part of this slide, you can see that uh, out of the animal procedures uh, performed in 2011, that 15% of those procedures were done on fish. And this came from the BBC Guide to Animal Ethics. This is a slide sequence that shows the early development of zebrafish as it would be observed under a light microscope. Uh, zebrafish develop very quickly. By about two and a half days post-fertilization, or DPF, uh, zebrafish will typically hatch um, if they're raised under standard conditions, and they'll actually begin feeding by day five. Um, so this slide um, shows you the growth of zebrafish research. So um, this, is, this shows the number of annual publications that have used zebrafish as a keyword. Um, you know, from the different journals. And you can see that, you know, uh, in 2012, there were over 1,800 publications that used zebrafish as a keyword, um, showing its tremendous growth in uh, popularity. Zebrafish made the cover of Science Magazine in 2005. 
Uh, again, this shows you know their increasing popularity. With all of this growth um, and all of this uh, use of zebrafish for biomedical research, there's also been problems as the infrastructure, the knowledge of the organism, the culture techniques, the nutrition, and the laboratory practices struggle to keep pace with just the use of the animal for other forms of research. Um, many medical researchers and veterinarians that have worked their entire careers with rodent models are really unfamiliar with fish and fish culture and its limitations and its advantages. Um, and so that has created um, some problems. Um, also, since the model has grown so rapidly, there are a lot of discrepancies between the different laboratories in how they treat their fish, um, how the fish are cultured, um, and the different techniques that, have, that go into the research. Um, for example, uh, there are big differences among laboratories in what the animals are fed, uh, how often they're fed, um, and how the you know growing environments are managed. This has um, the uh, the problem of creating discrepancies between different research laboratories, and also it has the potential um, to create uh, problems with the validity of research. Um, you know because any one of these factors can have tremendous impacts on research results. And so one of the needs for this community is to better standardize research methods um, for zebrafish husbandry, care, and culture, um, and also to better train individuals within the industry to use this fish as a model. In 2010, um, at a U.S. aquaculture meeting in San Diego, California, um, we got a phone call. Uh, the Zebrafish Husbandry Association was having their annual workshop, and they had identified um, you know, some of these needs for better trained labor, for more standardized methods, and we got a phone call. Um, you know, I, I was uh, actually reading to my young boy, um, and I uh, got a phone call late that night and uh, they asked us, you know, would you be interested in, in working with a group to develop a curriculum uh, for zebrafish husbandry education? Yes, absolutely. And uh, that resulted in a conference call. And uh, with these folks here, uh, Dr. Watts, uh, Dr. Trevero, uh, Chris Lawrence from Boston Children's, um, George Sanders from University of Washington uh, School of Medicine, um, Dan Castronova from the NIH and myself and uh, it was the result of this conference call that got everything moving in this direction and this really became our core group of uh, you know supporters to get this effort underway. After this conference call um, the University of Alabama at Birmingham Zebrafish Corps became a full partner. Um, the University of Alabama at Birmingham is a world-class research campus um, that has a very large, well-funded animal research program, or ARP. They are very familiar with all of the animal models and with biomedical research. Um, they are in very close proximity to Gadsden State Community College, only about an hour away, and so that makes them a perfect partner. Um, Gadsden State, you know, we specialize in aquaculture technical training and education. UAB specializing in world-class biomedical research, um, animal models, and, um, you know, research for laboratory animal care. They recently opened up their zebrafish core. That was in 2011. It's about 6,000 square feet. It has all of the, you know, latest equipment for husbandry, filtration, and food prep. Um, embryo injection, quarantine, and they have great uh, pathology facilities. And uh, that zebrafish core is managed by uh, partners in this effort, Dr. Susan Farmer and Dr. Stephen Watts. And that whole project is overseen uh, by Dr. Samuel Cartner, who's the Associate Vice President of Animal Research at UAB. The next step was to see if we could get funding to get this effort off the ground. Um, and so we sent proposals and you know went to several different agencies to ask them if we could get support for this effort. Um, 
you know, a group that I'm very familiar with, the USDA, um, they declined and said, well, this wasn't really their area of expertise, um, even though it was an aquaculture related area. Um, and then we went to ACLAM, uh, GLAS, and ALAS foundations or groups. And uh, these are foundations and groups that uh, have their mission statement to support um, laboratory animal care and research. Um, and ironically, um, none of them would really accept a proposal from us because they said it had to be original research and we were doing an educational program. Uh, so at that point, you know, with everybody kind of saying no, uh, we decided, well, heck, we're just going to do it ourselves. And so this was a meeting that happened in February of 2012. Um, it was a meeting between the faculty or the, the upper administration at Gadsden State Community College and uh, some of the upper administration at the University of Alabama at Birmingham, including the vice president of research, uh, Dr. Richard Marques. Um, and at this meeting, Dr. Marques brought a check for $10,000 to get the effort started. Um, and it was also during this meeting that both Gadsden State and the University of Alabama at Birmingham pledged personnel time and pledged uh, facilities and resources to get this effort going. And so this was the beginning. With this effort, we had a really unique challenge. We needed to design an entirely new curriculum um, based on the needs for the animal care staff and based on the needs of the zebrafish, um, you know, researchers, the different researchers that would be using this model. And uh, so we had a lot of unique needs that we needed to address and we, first we had to find out what those needs were. Um, we also needed to make this content available to a very large and very diverse audience at both a national and potentially an international level. Um, we also knew that if we were going to be truly effective, we had to be able to combine um, just the, the theory and the content with actual hands-on experiences. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, <clears throat> and last but not least, uh, you know, this kind of aquaculture is not something that we're really familiar with as an aquaculture group um, because it's really done on very kind of unique systems um, that, you know, that are provided by several different vendors and, uh, you know, have some, you know, kind of unique uh, qualities to them. So we knew that we would need a lot of help with this effort. So the next step was really reconnaissance. Uh, we had to find out what these people needed. And so we started with a preliminary survey that went out to the zebrafish listserv. And this kind of gave us an idea about uh, of what we were going to be up against. And then in 2011, I was invited to the uh, Zebrafish Husbandry Association's annual excuse me, annual workshop that was in New Orleans, Louisiana. And at this workshop, we, um, we distributed a pretty, uh, a pretty good survey, a pretty detailed survey of what the workforce needed and wanted. Um, the results of that survey, when they came back and we kind of gone over everything, we found that really that there was a huge need for qualified technicians, not only all over the country, but actually all over the world. Um, and that there were very specific knowledge and skills that they needed, that they wanted um, from their technicians. Uh, we found out that a lot of these jobs paid very well, and almost all of them had very generous benefits packages. And we also found out from the group that they wanted a combination of online training and hands-on workshops. And so this really gave us a good outline for what we needed to do. The next step was to recruit our team. And so uh, the next year at the Zebrafish Husbandry Association's annual workshop in Las Vegas, Nevada, I was set with the task of putting a team together to lead this effort. I basically chased down and pestered the heck out of every expert I could find. Um, it got so bad that people would see me coming down the hall and they would turn the other way. Um, and uh, But at the end of the day, I was able to uh, recruit 18 world experts um, in zebrafish husbandry, and uh, that would complement our group from Gadsden State and our group from UAB. It was also very important that some of these members 
be from the vendor reps that sell the different uh, you know, growing apparatus or the, the rack systems um, that we were going to need for this effort. And we were able to secure one member from each of the major vendors um, to work with us on this. So that was incredibly important as well. So the plan. We wanted to construct a very detailed online course through Gadsden State Community College. The online course was going to have four parts that we called modules. And each module would contain six to ten presentations um, of different topics. Um, all of these presentations would be scripted and voiced over using studio software and they would all contain online quizzes that we would be able to use to test student knowledge. So that was the online course. The second part of the effort was going to be the actual hands-on workshops. Um, and so we are going to start doing four-day, three-night hands-on workshops at Gadsden State Community College each year. And uh, during these workshops, we'll be emphasizing not the content so much that was given in the online portion of the course, but we will be emphasizing the hands-on skills. Uh, basic culture skills, spawning and larval culture, water chemistry analysis and interpretation, systems maintenance, um, and health management. So, you know, this was the plan. So how are we going to get this thing started? You know, and so we needed some quality time with our team of experts. And we decided that we were going to hold a project development workshop at Gadsden State and bring our team out to Gadsden, Alabama. So how in the heck do you get these 18 incredibly busy world experts to travel hundreds of miles at their own expense and work their tails off in nowhere Alabama for three days? Well, it's simple. We lied. We told them that they had won an extravagant five-day, four-night vacation package to a five-star resort and spa. And then when they arrived, we locked them into a room, and we didn't let them out until we got what we want. Well, just kind of kidding. But um, we picked them up at Birmingham Airport, and uh, we uh, transported them to a hotel in the Gadsden area. The next morning, we got them all up, and we got them all to the facility. And uh, we started dividing them up into teams, working teams. And so we uh, put them in pairs, and sometimes trios. Um, and they were all assigned a topic to work on that was based on their expertise. Um, and we had several working sessions over the workshop, over the, several, the three days of the workshop. And uh, we had all of our meals catered into the classroom um, to keep everybody on task. Um, and then during the evenings, we took the group out to uh, different restaurants and just, you know, had some time to wind down in the evenings. Um, everybody in the group reported that this was one of the best, uh, you know, workshops or whatever that they've ever attended and that they had a great time while working their tails off. It was really exciting. So these were our workshop participants. And as you can see, it's really we're developing kind of a who's who list for uh, you know zebrafish experts here. So really good stuff. And this is a picture of everybody um, at Gadsden State. Um, also the president of Gadsden State and uh, the dean of instruction. Um, the workshop was here during June, so you know really warm weather. But in June down here, we're we're already in the 90s all the time. So. So this is the online course. Um, the first module is water chemistry. It contains seven presentations. The second module is systems infiltration. And it contains six presentations on systems infiltration. Module three is colony management and, and nutrition, and it has seven presentations. And module four, health management, facilities, and compliance, and it currently has seven presentations. It is um, our intent that once this is completed, we will be updating all of these presentations as they need to be to keep the information as current as possible. And that's one of the reasons why you know, we wanted to kind of manage this whole project ourselves.
during the workshop, we also took some time out to have a little bit of fun. Um, this workshop was going on in the heart of our channel catfish season um, here in Alabama. And so I got all these lab rats out and got them wet and dirty. We uh, seined up a bunch of adult channel catfish um, in a pond. Those fish would later be consumed at the end of the workshop banquet. Um, and they also got the chance to uh, harvest channel catfish eggs um, and take those into the hatchery and, and uh, hatch them out. So um, we took some time to have some fun as well. This is our group's commitment to the well-being of fish. Um, if you know some of these people, Chris Lawrence, uh, Christine Liigi, uh, George Sanders, Eric Sanders, who was just on, just before me. So. Some more pictures from the, from the workshop. So where are we with this effort now? We have 27 drafts of presentations that have already um, you know, got the content outlined and been reviewed by the group. Um, Gadsden State folks, myself and Dr. Susan Farmer from UAB, are working on these every week. Um, we also you know, have various team members that are working on them each week. The University of Alabama at Birmingham is hosting webinars every two weeks with our team. Uh, to go over different presentations and to clean those up. We have about half of those presentations scripted um, and we're voicing them over now. We've got the art department at Gadsden State that's helping us to clean up the graphics of the presentations. Um, we hope to offer the first online course by the summer of 2014, so by this summer, and that we will be having our first hands-on workshop here uh, hopefully in August of 2014. So you can stay tuned to our website to keep track of where we're at with the effort and uh, eventually uh, to actually sign up to take the course. <clears throat> While building the course, we also had to build some dedicated spaces for zebrafish education. And so we had to completely renovate this wet lab space. Um, we took it all the way down to the studs and we had to put in new floors and uh, you know, change the walls. We changed everything in this room. And as you can see, we've got um, racks from all of the different major vendors all in one place. So that's going to be great. Um, and right now, we're actually growing fish in this room every day, and we're spawning fish every week. And we also have uh, live feed cultures going on. So um, the students that are currently in my program are getting lots and lots of experience uh, when it's not in use uh, for the workshops. These are other spaces that we renovated just for uh, you know, the zebrafish work. And finally, the students. Um, you know, we've been generating well-trained students um, from the very beginning of this effort. Um, you know, Kim uh, Tice did her internship at Boston Children's Hospital with uh, you know, Chris Lawrence. She's now employed at the NIH. Uh, Kayla Smith uh, is employed at the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff as a technician and she's getting to work some with Trace Peterson who came out of Michael Kent's lab in Oregon. Um, Allison Zanely um, and Re Rebecca Graham are all in full scholarships at the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff in their fisheries aquaculture program but um, they all did zebrafish work here. Uh, Claire Johnston Gossett is uh, looking to probably go into vet school as an aquatic vet. Um, you know, because of her interest in this. Um, Cassie Craddock did her internship at Tulane University School of Medicine with zebrafish. Um, and Brandy Klein Heiser, she was our first student here at Gadsden State that did zebrafish stuff, and she's now a full time employee at the UAB Zebrafish Corps um, and actually is a, the tech to one of the professors that works in the Corps there. Um, and then now we have currently uh, 35 students at Gadsden State. Uh, six of those have uh, bachelor's degrees, and nine of the students are here really almost to do zebrafish work exclusively. And we have a, we actually have another student who's an intern from a, a nearby university, and she's here just to do zebrafish as well. This is a rack card um, that we generated for the effort, and you can pick one of these up at um, the local and national meetings. Um, anytime any of our vendors are there, um, they should have these rack cards available to hand out to you. 
it kind of gives you some information and background on what I've just talked about and tell you a little bit about the members of the team and the different folks that are involved um, and where to keep up with the progress on this effort. Uh, can't thank the members of my education team enough. Um, and that membership has actually grown now. So uh, we keep adding people as we need to and as more people become is interested in being involved in, in the exciting stuff that we're doing here. So, uh, you know, but this team, I mean, came here and they worked their tails off um, and, and really um, they continue to work really hard at this effort, you know, each and every week. Uh, modifying presentations and uh, you know really working with us so it's good stuff um, this work could not have been done without the support of all of our vendors uh, with the support that initial support from the University of Alabama at Birmingham and the continuing support of the zebrafish husbandry association so a huge thank you to those folks and at this time I'm done um, so uh, if you have questions, please go ahead and submit those on the Q&A bar and uh, I'll take care of that and uh, you know, just uh, you can keep up with us on our website. This is our website here. So hopefully that'll stay on the screen for a few minutes and uh, you can write that down if you need to and uh, kind of keep up with our progress on the website and uh, I'll turn it over to you guys for questions at this point. So thanks very much for your attention and time. Uh, the first question I have is what is the estimated cost for the training um, that will begin this summer? Um, and uh, that hasn't been completely decided yet, but one of the things that we're looking at is that uh, it will probably be a four credit course, in which case it's, we're going to have to charge the credit hour rate for Gadsden State, which means uh, for out-of-state tuition, um, it would cost about $300, 300 to $350 to take the course. Um, for the actual hands-on workshop, um, you know, we're looking at uh, numbers, you know, we've run some numbers and we have kind of an idea what it's going to cost and, and that sort of thing. It will be an all-inclusive uh, type of effort where all you have to do is get to Birmingham International Airport. Uh, we'll pick you up there, we'll bring you to Gadsden, um, we'll have your hotel rooms and all of your meals taken care of already. And I think for that three-day, four-night workshop, it's probably going to cost um, you know, around $1,800 um, is kind of the number that we're looking at right now. Um, but that has not been finalized yet. And, uh, you know, we're still working through that with, you know, the team and uh, with, uh, you know, our upper administration as well at both UAB and Gadsden State. So hopefully that answers the question. Any other questions? Excuse me. So Rosalina, I don't know that I have any other questions at, th at this point in time, so do I just stay on here? Are there other questions coming in? Uh, 